Welcome to Talking With Tech. My name is Chris Bougay and I'm here with Rachel Madel. What's going on, Rachel? Chris, I have a story to share with you. I can't wait. Tell me. Okay. So I am in the process of doing an independent educational evaluation, an IEE, for uh, a student. And there's been a lot of aggressive behavior. And I know we've talked about that on the podcast. We have actually an entire episode uh, where I talk about a specific experience and share um, about something that was super scary that happened to me. And I wanted to bring it up today on the podcast because I feel like you know, it's kind of the side of our field working with complex communicators that we don't always talk about. And Mm -hmm. I think we all have experienced, um, you know, kids who have aggressive behavior because they're so frustrated that they can't communicate. Um, So anyway, I, you know, have been working with this family and realizing that um, there's a lot of aggressive behavior in the student's past. And I'm feeling a little apprehensive. I haven't met the student in person yet, but I'm feeling a little apprehensive about meeting the student in in real life. Um, so far, I've just been doing kind of some interviews with uh, parents and teachers and, um, you know, feeling a little scared, if I'm being honest, to like meet the student in person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, okay. So, um, the first thing that comes to mind is, and I'm sure you are thinking this already, but something that happens frequently in education, I think, probably too frequently, is an educator might come to another educator and be like, um, oh, wait till you get this student next year, or, oh, that kid. And already they've sort of uh, started to taint the someone's viewpoint uh, rather than giving the kid sort of a uh, an open opportunity. But then the kid themselves has probably already learned some so, okay, I do certain things and that has a certain result, right? So there's probably some, um, everyone's coming with baggage to the situation, right? So how are you thinking you might approach this when you meet this student? Well, yeah, I think you bring up a good point, which is like, I'm already like prepared with some of that baggage, right? And it's like, they're like forewarning me, which I appreciate, right? It's always nice to know, okay, like this student does have some aggressive behaviors. Here's what triggers it. So you know, I obviously appreciate that, but I also feel, yeah, a little nervous to meet the student in person. I mean, my plan, which is always my plan for the students that I'm working with and an assessment is to really just not have a lot of demands and expectations um, to just build a really good rapport and to, you know, engage with the student and the things that they're interested in and motivated by. Um, You know, I think Part of the challenge with an assessment, though, is that we have more limited time, typically. Um, You know, this isn't a student that I'm building a rapport with for, you know, therapy, which, you know, we can take more time. It's like, I have to get in there. I have to do this assessment. I have to do like some assessment measures, um, which is a whole nother conversation about the expectations there are when we are doing assessments and how, you know, there's a lot of pressure to do a standardized assessment for language and, you know, all of these other things that, you know, to be honest, I don't think are really useful and valuable. And I also think they put unnecessary pressure on us as clinicians. And then of course on our students, because we're trying to get some formalized assessment measure in our report that, you know, uh, talks about receptive language and expressive language and, you know, all the things that we're, you know, trying to assess for. Um, And so, you know, I'm feeling like I'm probably going to do just more informal assessment and observation and parent and teacher and SLP report to gather the information that I need so that I don't put too many demands and expectations on the student. Mm-hmm. Um, something that comes to my mind here is the, some of the words we use around uh, assessment. So, and I don't want to get too far away from the the topic of aggression either. But just since it came up about since the, what the, the scenario that's going to happen is you in a room doing an assessment with a, with an individual, um, we often uh, say the word standardized. So this is a test that has been given to many students uh, and many people. And then we have a score based on what all of those people have taken on or the results that they have on that test. And then we can say, okay, this other person that we're giving it to, how do they compare to this large sample size, right? Standardized. And then the opposite of that should be 
non-standardized, but we often say informal. Um, and there are still certainly things we can do that are still f- sort of formal assessments, meaning there's they're formalized processes, but we're not take they're not standardized. And so a great example, I hear you talk about it all the time, Rachel, in our presentations and on the podcast, is you're always looking for what does the student uh, say spontaneously, right? What is their non-prompted, they just say, or they, and when I say say, I mean use on a communication device do they express how do they express themselves what's that what's that look like what's that look like and that can be done through a language sample I meaning so you collect a language sample and then you analyze that language sample which again wouldn't necessarily be a standardized way but it's certainly a formal way of looking at language and is that seems like something that it sounds like you're going to try and do yeah, I mean, I'm definitely going to attempt to utilize spontaneous language sampling because I feel like that's the best way to assess where a student's language is and also whether or not you're making progress if we're thinking about therapy, right? Um, you know, a lot of our students can do, in, including the student, very good with imitation. So the student has some access to verbal speech, but is mostly imitating, um, has some generative language, but um, really stuck and not able to, you know, communicate everything that they're thinking, all the things that they're feeling. Um, so, you know, I'm definitely going to do a language sample. And I typically do that with all of my assessments, especially for speech and language um, when I'm doing, you know, a formal assessment. Um, I say formal, I mean, I'm writing a report. Report. So in my own practice, I don't always, you know, write reports depending on the situation, um, just because why, why spend all my time writing a report when I could just dive in and start teaching people how to use AAC and, you know, all the things that we know help ensure that a student will actually be able to benefit from AAC and use it um, effectively to communicate. So, um, but, you know, I oftentimes get assessments and IEEs and things like that. So I kind of have to follow the standard protocol for what does an AAC assessment look like? What does a speech and language assessment look like? And, you know, all the reporting measures that we have to do along with that. Can I ask, is there some sort of body that that I'm unfamiliar with that sort of governs the, the way assessments look and feel? I mean, no, but I think that there's just this expectation, right? Like in our field, when you write an assessment report, and I do think that there is guidelines from, you know, California, which is, you know, where I practice, um, as far as what is expected to to be included in a speech and language report. Um, I think there's kind of just like some basic things that we have to include. Um, and I will say in California, there are expectations around standardized assessment. Um, and I think that that's a pressure that we all feel um, oftentimes. And it's a challenge when we are working with complex communicators, emergent communicators, where it's really hard to assess uh, language, um, especially for kids who don't have access to verbal speech or it's not consistent access. Um, So I don't know that there's a governing body, but I definitely know that there's like an expectation um, and some guidelines, um, you know, from the school district. And that's basically who's contracting me is the school district to provide this IEE. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Would some of that okay? Well, again, let's focusing less on the assessment and more on how this started, the aggressive behaviors. Um, I'm sure another part of your assessment will be interviewing people, right? And so I'm sure you'll get lots of good information about uh how the students uh accesses communication, um, their their fine motor abilities, that kind of stuff, right? I mean, do you have sort of standard questions you ask uh, the the person that's being interviewed? Yeah, I mean, I think it's mostly just like, tell me what communication looks like. Is it spontaneous? What happens when you model things? You know, asking questions to get to the bottom of what level of language are we hearing from the student, if any? And if not, what kind of gestural communication or, you know, other types of communication are happening? And, you know, then getting to the bottom of what level of support and prompting is necessary to hear that communication. Um, You know, and so I think, just asking a lot of questions about that and also the motivations. Um, You know, we typically, one of the reasons I love the spontaneous language sampling is because that will show you the motivation, right? Like when you look at what a child is saying completely on their own or communicating in some way, um, it, it, it has to be that there's, there's motivation, right? Um, they're intrinsically motivated to communicate with you. Um, and so it's really getting to the bottom of those types of activities and things that the student's interested in communicating about. Um, all of that is important, not just from a language assessment standpoint, but also just for an AAC assessment standpoint. Those are the kinds of 
words and activities and um, you know situations I'm going to try to target during the AAC assessment to see if I can elicit you know more communication and um, more accurate, precise communication. And you know those are the things I'm going to be programming into an AAC system. And the words I'm going to be targeting are going to be directly related to what the students already showing that they can you know do and how we can expand on that. So Rachel, with the uh, like you said, this student may have some aggressive behaviors, and you're going to sort of approach this in a way that um, is mm. non-triggering for the student. So one of those, uh, th- so the student doesn't react in a way that might be aggressive. Um, so it sounds like you're going to try and follow the student's lead. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, I think the other question that I always ask when there's aggressive patterns or behaviors in the past is like, what will trigger the student? (laughs) Like, how will I know that some type of aggression is going to happen? You know, and what situations does this typically happen in so that we're able to kind of avoid those situations. So like, I know the student is very attention seeking. And so if they feel like they're not getting the attention that they want, that's when they'll aggress. Um, and so it's like, okay, my, I'm going to have undivided attention or try to, you know, on the student in any given time. Um, and if not, then I'm going to have them, you know, set up with their favorite song or YouTube video or something like that while I talk to the family. Um, so that was something that was super helpful, but yeah, I mean, I think just figuring out like, what are the triggers and how to try to avoid those if I can. And also to know we, oftentimes kids have telltale signs that they're about to, you know, get frustrated or lose their temper or, you know, aggress. And it's like those subtle things, like they start fidgeting in their seat or they start Mm -hmm. pulling at your shirt or whatever. Like every kid is so different. So it's like figuring that out is like half the battle and figuring out, okay, like I need to like pull back right now. I need to just like pause because like we're starting to get, you know, frustrated and upset. Right. Right. But even, uh, to, it doesn't sound like you're going to plan. To, there, there's nothing that you need to really push, right, in this assessment to see what they can do other than, right? I mean, is, um, and what I also heard you say is what triggers this, this student in the past has been lack of attention on the student. And here you are in a one-on-one situation doing an assessment. There's not, it's not like there's other students around or you're going to, your attention will be d- divided. So is that sound right? Yeah. I mean, I think that that's going to be working in my favor for sure. Um, I just need to find things that are highly motivating and exciting for the student and hope that we have an instant rapport with each other. Just a really great connection. Well, I have no doubt. I have no doubt that'll, that'll happen. And you won't be alone in the room with the student, will you? No, absolutely not. <laughs> Anytime I have any, you know, students who have any behaviors that have been aggressive in the past. I always try to have behavior support if they have that in their plan and their, you know, programming, um, and also the parents. Um, so I never, am, I never want to be alone with a student anyway, because <laughs> yeah. I feel like, you know, it's just, I want the family and whoever is supporting the student to be a part of the session and to watch what I'm doing so that I can explain what I'm doing. Um, mm-hmm. it's a teaching opportunity, right? Not always possible because, you know, sometimes kids are in school and the family can't be there. And, but, Mm -hmm. you know, if it's possible, you know, having people who know the student best in the room um, to obviously support behavior and, you know, uh, if there is any type of aggression, but, you know, more importantly to just like teach them, here's what I'm doing and here's why, and here's the things that you need to know about how to support communication for the student. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, let us know how it goes. I mean, uh, I'm I'm very interested to see um, how like wh- when you have in this experience with the student if what you notice do you know what I mean like because this is going to be something different that the student and a situation the student really it doesn't sound like they have a lot of experience with you know um, so I'm very curious to learn what the experience is like for you. Yeah, I'll definitely report back. I feel like I'm going to take a note to put this in the future banter recording once I actually do the assessment in a couple of weeks. Um, I'll report back you guys. And hopefully I'm going to be like, it was amazing. Actually, when we don't put demands on the student, they did great, <laughs> which would be great. Right. And, and, you know, I kind of have an inkling that's going to be the case. Um, and that's going to be the best case scenario because then I can go back to the team and say like, Hey, everybody, here's what we learned about this student. Um, you know, when we don't put so many demands, all of a sudden, 
you know, things open up for the student and they're able to learn and, you know, participate and engage. That has certainly been my experience. I certainly in, in certain private schools come in, do an assessment and it's like, wow, we've never seen him do those things before. It's like, yeah, because I'm not telling him what to do. I'm just sitting next to him playing with him. Um, and suddenly a lot more language spills out because there's not, not these demands. So I hope that's the same scenario for you. Me too, Chris. All right. Uh, let me tell you about our interview today. So um, a couple of episodes ago, we were talking about the AAC specialty certification that is coming out. And we were talking about some of the cons, potential cons of the certification. And uh, the conversation led to what's some alternatives rather than just taking the certification or becoming certified and not being certified, is there a different, better option? And one of the things we were brainstorming about was the idea of micro-credentials, meaning rather than just having one thing, you are an AE cert certified person, um, or an AAC specialty certification. What if there was many layers to that and you earn little mini certifications like badges, uh, like, like, um, scouts might earn badges, uh, for certain skills that they've acquired. And as of course people were listening to the podcast and someone reached out, Mike Hipple, uh, who's been on the podcast before. And he's like, Hey, Chris, by the way, we do that in Wisconsin already. I was like, what, Mike? He's like, yeah, that, it's already a thing. I was like, okay, tell me more. And he's, he's, so he, he put us in contact with uh, some of the people who have developed some of these, um, these micro credentials, not always specific around AAC, more about assistive technology in general, but the concept is definitely uh, the same. And so that's what this interview is today. It is with three individuals that have worked to bring the a to bring the certification, these micro credentials forward. It's with Daniel Parker, Kathy White, and Stacy Duffy, uh, all from Wisconsin. So without further ado, let's listen to the interview. Hey there, everyone. Each week, our audio engineer, Michaela, and podcast producer, Luke, work tirelessly to keep the podcast looking and sounding great. They're able to be paid for their work because of the generosity of listeners just like you who have signed up to be supporters at patreon.com slash talking with tech. Most Patreon supporters contribute $8 a month, which is roughly $2 an episode. Members of our Patreon community also get access to bonus content, which includes curated resources and materials, behind-the-scenes recordings, and early access to certain interviews. Show your support by signing up at patreon.com slash talking with tech. Now on with the show. Welcome to the Talking With Tech podcast. My name is Chris Bouguet, and today I'm here with multiple special guests, and I'm going to uh, let them introduce themselves here in a moment. Um, well, I guess maybe we should do it now. Uh, do, who wants to start? I can begin. Uh, my name is Daniel Parker, and I'm one of the assistant directors on the special education team at the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction. Hi, my name is Kathy White. Uh, I was an assistive technology specialist for the Janesville Public Schools for 33 years. And for the last uh, two plus years, I've been working with the AT4 project. And for the last year, starting now, this is two years now coming, um, I have been the, my, the co-chair with Stacy Duffy. So I'm now co-chairing the AT Forward project. And I am Stacey Duffy. I am a consultant at CISA2 and also the transition specialist at CISA2. And as Kathy mentioned, I am I have the pleasure of being the co-manager of the AT Forward project uh, with Kathy. Now, just I, I'm gonna I want to kind of set the stage for our listeners today. But before we do that, um, you just intrigued me because Kathy and Stacy, you're using some acronyms. So the AT Forward Project is that your State Tech Act? How does what exactly is that? I can probably speak a little bit to it um, since I was, it is a, it's a project through the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction. Um, just like every state educational agency, we receive federal funding through the Individuals with Disability Education Act. And we have some of that money as discretionary to use on various improvement and technical assistance and systems level improvement projects across the state of Wisconsin. And um, when COVID hit, 
there was an increase in federal funding to states through the CARES Act, which is a federal legislation that provided additional monies to state agencies, such as the Department of Public Instruction. Um, and we were able to enhance some of the projects that we do in Wisconsin. And our director at the time, Julia Hartwig, um, had inquired. She knew that we had some very passionate folks on the special education team about assistive technology, and we wanted to do some additional things. And it really fit with COVID um, in terms of the technology needs in schools. And uh, so we had a two-year project using the CARES Act funding that we named Assistive Technology Forward. Um, it's just the name we gave it. And we partner in Wisconsin with our cooperative educational service agencies to carry out many of our special education initiatives. And we were already funding CESA 2 which is a cooperative educational service agency in the southern region of Wisconsin. And we are already funding them to do an assistive technology lending center. We are already funding them for an Accessible Educational Materials Center. So they were a natural partner to use this additional two-year funding um, for this new project. And we, it was a, a success beyond measure. Um, and we decided when the CARES Act funding ended to continue that project using our general discretionary grant funding to keep, keep the momentum going and to keep doing great things in Wisconsin related to assistive technology. That's awesome. So it's really those that money was a kickoff. And then it was just like, everyone's doing awesome work. And we're seeing the outcomes that we're expecting or even better. And we just keep it going. Let's find a way to keep it going. Absolutely. That's exciting. That's really exciting. All right, Kathy, Stacey, anything to add to that before I kick us off to the real topic of today? I think Daniel covered it. All right, fantastic. So let me bring in the story here. So um, it, it, on our podcast, we have been over the last uh, couple of years now, I guess, talking about something that has been uh, hitting the world of AAC. And that is an idea uh, for an American Speech and Hearing Association to have a AAC specialist certification. We've had some people come and uh, talk about why that became a, a thing that that, uh, that ASHA might be pursuing. And then we've also had others that have sort of come out against it. It's kind of a, a controversial topic where some people are saying, we don't need that in the field. We would, um, maybe there's a better way to do things. And it's not just pass a test, maintain some sort of uh, certification or, or get a certification or have some sort of profile. One of the things that came out of our most recent episode we were talking about that is an idea that I brought forward of micro-credentialing. So the idea here, if people are not familiar with that, is the idea not, not that you would study for a big test, pass a test, maybe the test would be, let's throw a number at it, $250 to $500 uh, to get some certification. And then you have to maybe maintain that certification every year by paying more money or maybe uh, keeping some sort of portfolio. All of that seems to me very um, antiquated. In the in here we are in in uh, this contemporary day and age that maybe there's a better way that could be more equitable. Like uh, some of the downsides of having that certification is uh, that that might have that cost barrier is you know imagine a new graduate out of school might not be able to afford to pay for that certification and how long does it take for them? Um, people start at the different starting lines when it comes to funding, so. Um, it might not be an equitable solution, but many more certifications with lesser criteria around them, like I'm certified in little parts of AAC, not just one AAC, um, one AAC certification is sort of intriguing. And so while um, one of the our friends of the podcast is Mike Hippel, who is uh, maybe famous up there in Wisconsin, famous around in our parts, and I'm in Virginia. So he is uh, um, uh, a force to be reckoned with. He listened to the podcast and he said, oh, yeah, Chris, we do that. We do that in Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, you, wait, you do? You already have uh, credentials? So he said, yeah. And, he, and that's how we got hooked up is he sent um, your names and said, Chris, you should interview them on the podcast. These these are the people that sort of have, uh, have um, led the way, at least in our state, with micro-credentialing. So with that said, now correct me with the story if I said anything wrong or how you might change that or really clarify it. But in my head, as we lead into it, that's what that's how I'm thinking this came together and what we're going to talk about today. 
Yeah, you know, absolutely. Mike was a, uh, we have a council on special education. All states have a, a council on special education run through their state educational agency. And Mike Hippel is a former council member and he's an AAC user. And I will have to say he was instrumental in um, making recommendations to our department around the needs around AAC in Wisconsin. And I mean, he is definitely one of a key stakeholders in us um, needing to highlight light um, assistive technology and and with our AT Forward project, the two kind of main areas we're focusing in on are AAC as well as accessible educational materials because we see those as two of the biggest needs in Wisconsin. So yeah, Mike is a great connector and um, yeah, absolutely. Cool. And am I am I accurate in thinking that you've done some work in this idea of micro credentialing? Yeah. Um, Kathy, why don't you share a little bit about this? Because you were a, a big part of um, kind of helping us think through how to do that. We had the idea. We have an AT work group at DPI that includes Kathy and Stacy and other stakeholders. Um, and we kind of talked about, hey, this is a neat idea to kind of create just enthusiasm around AT and building capacity of educators around it. And AAC is certainly one of the modules, but the folks at CISA too really helped us make that happen. Well, great. Yeah. One of the things that I think really drove all this was that when when you work in the school system and either you have a speech and language degree or in my case, I, you know, I'm a certified teacher uh, working with kids with special needs. Uh, and then I have my master's in assistive technology, but we're kind of a, a unicorn. <laughs> you know, we're kind of rare when it comes to those kind of things. So how do we help more people um, gain their skills? And as you are quite aware, I'm sure, Chris, is that every Every time we think we know something and we're like, yep, we got this, uh, guess what? It just changed. You know, I used to always say that technology changes as fast as you and I change our socks, you know, which is daily, um, especially with everything that's going on right now in the world that we're changing all the time. And, and how does anyone keep up and how do we make sure that we're applying it to our schools or I've heard from, um, you know, as being in education for over 30 years, I hear from others, they're like, well, I just landed in the school. And then they said, guess what? You're doing assistive technology too. And then how do you keep up with that? How do you, you're like, oh my gosh, now what else am I going to do? And and how do I make sure I've got all the right information? And is it, you know, a, con, um, a very concise amount of information that I can use? Uh, when do I go to school? When do I do this? You know, when do I do all this extra stuff? So that's where the micro credentialing, I think, kind of came in where we started to think about that instead of having a tech on license, um, because that, again, is a big expense. Like you said, it's going to cost you a lot of money. It's going to cost you a lot of time. And what happens when you're done? <laughs> you know, where's that that extra piece that goes into it? So the micro credentialing kind of comes along with our um our community of practice that we do. So we wanted to fold that in. So as you as you become a member of our community of practice, we invite you to go ahead and, and, and take a look at the micro-credentialing. And we are using um, the ATEM, so it's A-T-I-M modules, uh, which have been created by some of, you know, wonderful people from all over the world have created these modules and they're kept up to date. And as long as you're not trying to get their certifications, there's no cost involved. So we kind of freed up that kind of a piece. So we've got that that got freed up. And then we took a look at what are the areas where people are really needing all of these um, assistance in? You know, we have our, our low incidence groups, of course, you know, those who are uh, um, like our kids with more blind and deaf or more uh, physically impaired. We've got those. But then we have these large populations. Ogcom is one of them. Um, and most augmentative communication specialists, when they go to school, they actually only get one class in AAC, in augmentative communication. So you're like, now what do I do? I have this huge group of kids and I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do or how to keep up. So the ATEM modules help us keep up because they're always being reviewed and renewed and, and new materials been added. They just added a great one on smart houses the other day and all this new smart technology is coming out. It's really cool. So we had that going on. And then what we did is we um, got some very smart people at CISA too. Um, Frank is one of them and Beth, she was another one that came on board and they really helped us kind of figure out what do we need from people to make sure that this um, this credentialing has some weight and, and that they are putting a little bit of, of, of themselves into this game. So we use a lot of Google. So we use Google Forms and some Google documentation. 
And what people are doing is they're watching the ATEM modules, um, participating in those, screenshotting that they have actually completed that and received a, a passing score on their quizzes that they have embedded. And then what we ask, ask them to do is to look at the some action statements. What are you going to do with this information? And then to kind of reflect on that. And then that gets submitted to us and we read them. We read every last one of them to find out how people are doing. And then we try to add uh, in additional things into there. Like um, if you're working with kids on literacy and you you found this is extremely interesting, you know, maybe I can throw in two and a half cents and say, have you read Karen Erickson's book on um, comprehensive literacy and point them in another direction. So you're no longer alone in this process. You know, you, you now have a community that's going to be behind you and you have a new badge. And then when we're done, they get an electronic digital badge that gets sent to them. And at present time, we have um, 16 badges that you can earn. Um, we have, at this point in time, we had 271 people who have registered for badges. Uh, 134 have been uh, given out or applied. We have eight educators. We decided we were going to do a macro credentialing. So if you earn at least seven badges, you get a, a macro credential. So you can get just one or however many you want. Um, we have had over 25 school districts in our organization throughout the state have participated in this. So it's not just pocketed. We're able to kind of branch this out. Kathy, let me ask some follow-up questions here because sure. that sounds amazing. <laughs> um, so a typical ATEM module, uh, for those who aren't used to it or ex experienced it, how long would you say to, it would take to go through? Like you mentioned that Smart Homes one, right? Like, let's say, oh, that sounds cool. I want to learn about that. How long would you think it takes to do that? Most of them will have a little time stamp in there, and most are an hour and a half to two hours long. So because there's no cost involved and because it's all internet-based, do it on your own time. Whenever you feel like it, you know, you've got 15 minutes here, you can always save and exit and go back. So it makes it very user-friendly. And those are open to anyone in the world, right? So it's just you taking that content and you put some structure around that 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 free open source content to... Um, to help maintain a, uh, a structure and advertise for people can then use that as to advertise the work that they've done in their professional learning. Correct. All right. Next follow up question is, are there any restrictions of any kind other than um, you have to be in Wisconsin? <laughs> well, and actually, you know, we said you didn't have to necessarily be in Wisconsin. I mean, we have had a few people from out of state um, that have come in and, and taken a look at it and taken a few badges. So we, we didn't even put that restriction really on it, unless it gets too big for us to handle. <laughs> sure, sure. I can understand that that concern. All right. Can you talk a little bit uh, about the badges themselves? Um, uh, again, just in case people are still a little like, well, what does he mean by what do you mean by badging? I, I often equate it to something, maybe some background knowledge that some people might have is like the scouts, right? Uh, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, you do you get your whittling badge when you have proved that you've done whittling. So same thing you you might get your well, and I'm curious what uh, what some of those different badges might be. And then the second follow up to that is, do the badging have like artwork associated with them? I mean, are they like certificates that uh, you've got some sort of graphic design so that they kind of they kind of look cool? You know what I mean? Like um, some 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 people who play games might recognize uh, as like video games. This really comes out of video game culture. These micro credentials is like mm -hmm. I've I've thrown so many passes in my Madden football game, and you get your little. Yeah. Uh, passing badge, you know, and there's some artwork associated. So this really uh, might be an analogy. So I, I'd love to hear more about those. That's what we were going for. Yeah. <laughs> uh, each badge has been, uh, Frank actually has uh, done a wonderful job. Uh, he works at CISA too. He's he's the magic behind some of these things and Beth Clark too. Um, and they were able to design our different badges. So, um, you know, each one he put a little piece of artwork too. So like the, the one with students with physical disabilities has a little wheelchair on it. You know, others have textbooks on them for like accessible educational material. Um, we have, you know, low, low vision. We have a, a badge in low vision and vision needs, uh, deaf and hard of hearing. There are actually 16 of them, um, everything from AugCom. And we did just add a couple of badges this year. So some new ones. We added an AT for administrators, uh, assistive technology for administration. We added one in, in, um, the AIM process for accessible educational materials. We added one of those. 
Um, early childhood, we have a badge. Um, Stacy, what am I missing here? The new ones? No. Yeah, you. I think you. We added a second transition one, but that was late in the spring last year as well. And just a couple of side notes in here, just to add to the conversation. What's nice about those digital badges is a lot of people will attach them to their email signature line, so that that when they're sending their emails, that people, yep, you'll see all those badges exactly going across, which is a great use of them. Um, and speaking of the use of the micro credentials, we've had a lot of uh, varying use. I mean, number one, obviously, is pe- uh, to support people's learning as they want to grow professionally in these in these different areas. Um, and while I'm I want to speak a little bit more about the the choice and the learning that we offer through the micro credentials. But another use of the badge is uh, people supporting their professional uh, practice goals, their PPGs in Wisconsin. They're utilizing those for some districts are looking at the possibility of using a, the micro credentials for professional development hours in relation to compensation. So there's been a wide variety of use, but we love, um, as Kathy can attest to the feedback of, I can't wait to take this back to my department and share out with my colleagues. And that's what it's all about because we want to, you know, uh, eventually uh, get to improving practices for all students and access engagement as we talk about that. But with the, the really the key to the micro credentialing too, is there is a lot of uh, choice in the learning um, the learning phase and each under each of those categories that Kathy was talking to, there are options so they can take, they can choose between those modules that she referenced. And then also we have videos from our community of practice um, that we mentioned around this assistive technology forward. Um, and so there's, there's some choice in that learning, which is really nice. And then also in that process too, Kathy talked a little bit about, um, you know, we have like the learning phase and we have the action phase, like what actions will you take or have you taken to utilize this new information you've learned? And then the reflection, you know, piece of that as well. How has it affected your ability to use this resource, train others to use it, you know? And so it really, it really, and that was helped developed um, again through our colleagues at CISA too. We keep talking about Frank, Frank Devereaux and uh, Beth Clark to give them a little shout out with this as well, but really to um, embrace all aspects of learning and provide, as you mentioned, to an equitable learning experience for all, for all users. Stacy, oh my goodness. All right, let's just touch on some of the things you talked about there just to uh, applaud them and celebrate them. First of all, that idea of choice, right? So we're modeling universal design for learning through our professional learning. So it's like, oh, not everyone has to do the exact same thing. You're embedding that into it. Look at Kathy shaking her head like, see, yeah, exactly. We're, we're trying to illustrate that there's there's different avenues to get to the same, uh, to learn the same content and acquire the same skills. The second thing that um, you said that really resonated with me, and Kathy, you had mentioned it, Stacy, you uh, you uh, reiterated it, and now I'm going to ch- uh, blow a trumpet on it, is that idea of reflection. So that is something that is often missing in professional learning. Uh, you go to a conference, you listen to somebody talk, and then you don't talk about what you're going to do about it or what you're going to do with that knowledge or what you learned. On, you're not re- really reflecting how it's going to, you're not going to take the time to reflect on your own practice. So the fact that you built that in um, as a uh, from the ground floor with people reflecting, I think, is really significant in order for people to move. I mean, I know right now it's the at the time of this recording, it's the beginning of the school year, probably around lots of places around the country. And there's a lot of teachers that are going to be in the forced family fun, I call it, you know, like they have to do professional learning, come to this thing. Um and it's it's a lot of ticky boxes like, OK, I, did, did I do I, I watched the video, I answered the questions and then I forgot about it, which is exactly the type of learning we're trying to get away from. Right. But that's still how a lot of professional learning is. And so the fact that you're structuring it differently and really modeling what we want the learning for uh, for school age children to be is really exciting. So I don't have a question after that. I was just really excited about how you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we yeah. appreciate your enthusiasm for that. We know yeah. UDL is, you know, we definitely took that into consideration in modeling that for our educators. And again, those are uh, Beth Clark, who, with, who we keep mentioning, she is all in on UDL and does work with DPI on UDL. Um, and so having her support and guidance in the creation of this was, was fantastic. But um, love that you're pointing that out again in the reflective a piece of it. So 
Yeah, and at DPI, you know, uh, a couple of big influencers on the entire project have been Jane Bischoff. We actually have a universal design for learning consultant on our team. Um, Andrea Bertoni, who at the time was our speech language pathologist, and Iris Jacobson, who works with students with significant disabilities. They were kind of the driving force behind, you know, how do we how do we develop meaningful professional learning that can be more sustainable. You know, we don't always have the resources for investing in direct coaching models with coaches who are actually following up. That is like the, that is the bar we uh, try to get to, but we're trying to do with this community of practice to have not just one and done professional learning where you just leave and you got the content and now, now what? Um, and the micro credentialing as, you know, Kathy and Stacy have talked about, it really is part of a package of, a, of, a, of additional learning. Uh, you know, if we have time later, uh, other AAC work, there's a new addition to this year was a partnership with the Wasteman program, um, who is a university uh, technical assistance center through the University of Wisconsin here, who does a lot of AAC assessments for students with disabilities. And we're added additional funding in our project so that when folks go into their CASC clinic, their clinic to get assessments, um, we are funding uh, follow-up professional development that the uh, clinicians at Wasteman Center will provide to the educators so that, you know, they're just not doing all the work for the school teams. Um, they're actually building the capacity of those school teams to continue that work with AAC with those students and learn how to do those good assessment practices so that they're building their own capacities. So, you know, micro credentialing plus the community of practice plus some of these other things are, are really in an attempt for more sustained ongoing learning and building that capacity in the field. Wow. Okay. Let me make sure I understand this correctly. So if someone on a school-based team says, we think this student might need AAC, what happens? And it's probably wildly different across the, yeah. (laughs) But what what do you want to happen? Well, certainly uh, any student that requires AAC uh, should receive AAC. And, and, and as many of your listeners may know, you know, one of the required processes when developing a student's individualized education program for students receiving special education through um, under the Individuals Disability Education Act, they have to consider assistive technology as a factor. And AAC is a, a type of assistive technology that allows that access and ability to communicate. And, um, you know, we know that that although we want every district to have really highly trained expertise in AC, we're not always seeing it. So how do we build that, right? And how do we do that efficiently? Um, and so, you know, IEP teams do have to make those considerations. They do have to follow up in that. And so hopefully like this micro-credentialing program is just another option for them to get, to build those competencies within their, within their districts for students who need AAC and um, should be provided that under uh, IDA and, and, and state and federal special education requirements. Daniel, let me just comment on this because this, let me bring it back to the previous episode that we've done and tie it back to the concern that we have about an AAC certification mm-hmm. is that imagine that IEP team is sitting around and going, well, which one of you has the certification? Mm. Well, we don't. But what Stacy, the way she described it, Stacy, the way you described it was like, imagine having different badges along the bottom of your email, right? So mm-hmm. it's like, well, I know this aspect. Like I'm a, I'm really good at, let's say, modeling. Or I've, when I say really good, I've, I've completed the, the, I've, I've earned my, my modeling badge, right? I've, I've earned my descriptive teaching badge i've earned my that's the idea that that then the you have a more eclectic team of like well someone has this and someone has that we're not waiting for uh someone well let's call someone on and put the, the student on a waiting list and now they're waiting valuable time to get some expert in we we can use the knowledge at the table is that what is that part of what we're going for is building the capacity of the team right Kathy, I see you nodding. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, absolutely. That's what we're looking to do. We're building building that capacity. And, and because we're giving uh, each educator more voice and choice. So if you have a, you know, a large AAC need in your classroom, um, maybe yours is early childhood. So maybe you might want to take one module that would be like an early childhood. And then we'd have like two that we would pick out in AAC that we would require for that badge. So you have some voice and choice in that. Or maybe you have a student who's who's blind deaf and you need to learn about 3D symbols. So you could add that in there. So you take the two AAC ones and then 
one. So we require two two that uh, in our modules and then one that you can have outside, either our COP meeting, an article, something else. But yeah, because then we can we can grow this capacity. And like you said, we're not waiting because we know the wait lists are terribly, terribly long, especially if a, a if you have a student who has uh, multiple complex disabilities, you know, you're, you're going to wait a very long time and there's no reason to wait. Um, let's pull our resources. Let's get together. Now, something else that I've sort of um, hypothesized about the micro-credentialing, and maybe you have some experience that you could comment on it, because Kathy, you mentioned a bunch of numbers there of people who have participated. And uh, I think also at the time of this recording, we are in the middle of the great resignation. Well, I don't know if it's the middle. We're somewhere in the great resignation. Teachers you see all the time are are either leaving um, or are not coming back at the beginning of the school year. Um, and so we're looking for how do we how do we retain retain these people who have spent uh, we've, we've we've spent valuable time and resources in helping increase their professional knowledge and their professional skills. And I always think, mother, here's my hypothesis that if they're supported well, then they'll maybe stay longer, right? And when I say supported well, I don't think necessarily throwing a couple extra bucks at them. Of course, why we always, we always want you know more money for teachers. I'm not saying that, right? <laughs> but I just sometimes I think it's not really about the money. It's about the the um, being respected, having feeling comfortable about what you're doing every day, feeling secure about what you're doing every day. Some of these more intangibles might help people stay longer. And I'm just curious with the feedback with the people have already participated have you seen any correlations there good feedback to greater uh, teacher retention those sorts of things well i can't speak to the teacher retention piece but i can speak to the the wonderful reflections that we received people are like saying things like thank you I'm, i no longer feel alone in my district you know especially you know wisconsin has a lot of very small rural schools you know and you may be the only speech and language person for like you know 15 20 schools and you're traveling all over the place you know, and we may only have one or two students in pocket that may need something. So having those resources where you can go back, we have, you know, made a um, like a depository for resources, like all of our community of practice um, sessions are recorded and chunk them into like 15, 20 minute piece chunks so that you can go back and research and use those when you need them. So, so that it's kind of a place where you can go back and get more information. But from the people that have refinished um, their badges, it's things like, wow, I never knew this process was this easy. Thank you for showing me there is a way to do this that's systematic. Um, and I think that that's the great part about those ATEM modules is they all talk about the set process, the student, the environment, the task, and the tool. It's repeated over and over in every module. So by the time you go through a few of them, you're like, yeah, I got this. And then you feel more confident on what you're doing. You know, when we don't feel confident, you know, people then leave, they go elsewhere, you know, and if they're not supported, they're going to go elsewhere. So um, I really feel like this has done a great job for that. And we get, you know, three, four reflections from every person. Uh, and it's just wonderful to read. And I should also point out, you know, we've only been, even though we've had the project for two years, you know, when you develop a new statewide project, it takes, you know, three, six months to get it off the ground. Um, you know, we really hit our steam rolling probably at the beginning of last fall. And we started the micro-credentialing program kind of maybe mid-fall. And so we're just at the beginning, really, with all of this. Um, you know, our, my personal goal is to have at least one representative from every district in Wisconsin in the community of practice. Um, I, that's been the goal of our work group. And um, we want to see this kind of continue and in, in building that capacity. We, we fully support people. There's a that UW-Milwaukee has a beautiful assistive technology certificate program. Um, so we highly encourage people getting professional learning through higher education. So this isn't meant to re replace uh, the value of higher ed. Uh, but at the same time, in having conversations with them, they, you know, they've been fully supportive of other ways that people can just build their capacity. You know, this is a, is a starting point for getting things that you can do immediately with students. And it's also not discipline specific. You know, I worked with students with autism starting back in the 90s in Lawrence, Kansas. And, you know, we were using augmentative communication systems and all kinds of video modeling and all kinds of things. Um, and it's come so far. So I'm a big believer that, you know, both general special education, everyone can benefit um, from building their capacity around assistive technology and AAC. 
let me follow up a couple of follow-up questions but let me ask a band about the people who have taken it um so, uh, a uh, uh frustration i'm gonna say frustration of mine over the years has been that i oftentimes i feel like i'm presenting to the wrong room like i'll be in there and it's like well you're all the at people you know about accessible education materials i'm gonna take your knowledge level from a 9.8 to a 9.9 .9. You know, who I really want is that general ed third grade teacher who doesn't know anything about accessible educational materials. And we could say, like, could you have this, this, this? Here's some criteria. And you could really then take them from a two to a nine, you know. And I'm just curious, when you look at who's taken this, are you finding that same sort of um, uh, dynamic where it's like, yep, these are the special ed people. These are the people that sort of already get it. Um, or is, is it starting to branch out? We're getting more, more inclusive with, um, with general ed teachers. I think we are starting to get more inclusive and, and in our plans for the upcoming year in terms of our community practice meetings, recessions, we are specifically targeting some of those to make them more inclusive for gen ed teachers, for our administration, for all staff supporting students. Um, because I'm going to look at it through a transition lens for a moment, just as all comes down to inclusive practices, you know, that, you know, the access and the engagement um, and, you know, from NTACT, which is another acronym, the National Technical Assistance Center on Transition, one of the research-based predictors for post-secondary success in education, career, and independent living um, is inclusion. And we recognize that assistive technology is absolutely critical for that. And so we are really, as we continue to plan for the upcoming year, uh, really keeping that in mind and recognizing we need to reach beyond the the quote unquote ATV you know, people um, and really branch that out. Well, and we're starting to get some data too, Chris, from from this that I think is going to help us. Like when we look at all of this, we see that our most um, most of our badges have been awarded in augmentative communication, which kind of then when we saw that, you know, we started to talk to Daniel more about that. You know, how do we then support more of that in our state? Um, the second one we have is in device access, you know, for those kids who are, uh, you know, who need that alternative access kind of a piece, you know, how do we support that? And the third one that, that's the biggest right now is in writing, which is, is huge. I mean, how do we help those, um, those students who, with those invisible disabilities, you know, to become better writers and readers and using assistive tech? So I think we can use the data to, to help drive us as a state too, and to help to support people. Amazing. Amazing. Le um, just another logistical question. And then I want to dig into this uh, community of practice for a second and the structure around that. A logistical question is how often do people have to retake? Like if I've done the ATEMS and I got my badge, does that, does that, does that expire after two, five years and I have to get another one? What's the, uh, what's the end? I know how to get into it. How long does it last? Uh, we have not put an end on it. I, I don't know if Daniel plans on it yeah. or not, but uh, we had not put an end on it. Um, we've had, it, it's nice to see that more and more people are taking more than one badge because they're starting to see how that can make them a, a better, well-rounded instructor and teacher. Um, I'm starting to see, you know, I've gotten emails from people that are paraprofessionals. They want to take the badges. So we're starting to see that come out from just being that it's just that special educator, you know, and speech and language people. Now we're getting occupational therapists. We're getting paraprofessionals, you know, and we're hoping, you know, to get others, you know, uh, reg ed, of course, is, is what we really hope and administration too, so that everyone's got the base of knowledge. So at this point, nope, they're not going to expire. But I think once you get in and you're like, you, you've got this free resource now on ATEM and they're always updating it. So you go back and you can then, or hopefully maybe somebody will take them on their own, you know, and go, yeah, this is a great place for me to get information. I think some of the new modules around the administrators, it'll be really interesting to see the interest in that. Um, and that will be something we'll be highly advertising through the department. I mean, all of the badges also come from with a certificate with Wisconsin DPI, because we know we, as a state agency, we have, you know, some influence and, and um, kind of um, directing people to really high quality, um, you know, professional learning. And then also I think the accessible educational materials, you know, when we think about our general education teachers, um, you know, there's there's so many easy, free, simple tools, um, plus things like Learning Alley and Bookshare and, and places that you can go to get 
um, accessible educational materials. And, and those are going to be, you know, I see some modules being more specialized for roles of special educators and some more specialized for general educators. And since we're, we're just at the tip of the iceberg in this, I think we have to look at that. And then we do need to have review um, kind of loops after two or three years and look at data and see who's in the field and following up and encouraging people if there's been changes in the modules or find out how have you been using this. And the other thing is like, you know, how well, are, as, as Stacey said, how are we working as a team around this? You know, how are educators supporting each other so that, you know, it's not just one person that has the knowledge and expertise. How do we use that person in our building or in our district to help train and build capacity of other people? And I really see that that's one kind of focus of that community practice of building the capacity. One of our guiding tenets at the beginning was building the capacity of general education teachers and families um, because there's a huge role that, you know, goes beyond special education teachers in the lives of children and we need to really um, be supporting one another and and being able to provide those supports well okay so a couple of things there i think you make a really good case daniel for why maybe certain ones don't need to expire but you just get it and then you have it like some especially the theoretical ones like okay once i know about uh certain things they're not that again the change that might happen in three to five years i know the theory i know how it's supposed to work i understand mm-hmm. that sure some, some technology might update and change and so there might be little little tweaks like you said if atems update it updates maybe uh but what sounds like even more important is this community of practice is, yeah right um so let's dig into that if you don't mind let me ask um what's the structure around that so like uh is it discussion boards you watch videos you watch a, listen to a podcast and discuss it how does it all really work and how do you get into it stacy okay <laughs> so uh with our community of practice um we have this year planned for 12 meetings on various topics so when i say meetings it's re- they're very collaborative in nature so we will bring in a presenter on on the subject, spend the first portion of that uh, person will, like, for example, accessible education materials, you know, providing some information around that. But really, we are focusing then on those like breakout collaborative opportunities where those discussions can happen around some guiding questions in the area. What's really nice is all of our community of practice meeting sessions are virtual and open to anyone in the state and also open, as Daniel alluded to, to families, you know, whoever's interested in it. Awesome. Join. We're, we're happy to have you. I believe as of June, uh, we had over 800 members in our community of practice from since the project started, which is fantastic. And as Daniel also mentioned, we are hoping to get at least one representative from each of our our districts, but very happy we continue to grow in numbers as the word gets out. And then uh, so we have those um, live synchronous meetings. And then afterwards, as I believe Kathy mentioned, we do record those meetings and then break them down into easily sort of digestible chunks of information. So if I'm looking specifically for a topic, I can go back to this resource library of videos from the COP and watch that. So not only are we providing this amazing learning opportunity, we're also building this great resource library for anyone to learn, you know, further their learning. And it's been really nice. I personally think, especially as in the field of special education, we do have a lot of staff turnover and people new to the field and what an amazing resource right just to be able to come in feel supported be a chance to ask your questions learn from those that have lived it uh and then you know and also then have all those those resources right at your fingertips uh is just truly incredible and what i've loved from from stacy and kathy is you know the department really wanted to make this cross agency and obviously focused on education since it's an education kind of project but we've really welcomed in our partners from department of health services like laura Plummer, um, trying to connect with um, you know the independent living centers where they do a lot of amazing assistive technology work higher ed um, our, obviously our cooperative educational service agencies, our CESAs, our school districts, families, parent support and advocacy organizations. So we keep looking for new partnerships in the community of practice because I think the best community of practices are 
looking at uh, people across the lifespan, right? Um, so that is one of our goals big time. And they've just done such a great job of bringing in speakers who not only are the content experts, but they use, they, they, they're they experts in using the technologies that they're talking about and um, have just done an amazing job. And we, we have an AT work group that has external and internal members at DPI. And um, we, we always kind of run through topic ideas and try to make it really collaborative. What is the field really needing right now? And trying to adjust our community practice meetings, and they're they're so good at finding just high high notch, really amazing um, facilitators to get that discussion going with our members. And just to take on to what Daniel just ended there with, at the end of the year, we sent out a survey to all those members, and really is is this AT worker? If we really listen to, okay, what what do they want? What do they need right now that we can you know help them? And that's what we're planning for then for this upcoming year. And in addition, I, you know, we, we had the division of vocational rehabilitation come with to a COP meeting too. So really, as Daniel said, just really trying to truly bring in, you know, all these agencies, all these, you know, supports for students. So. Yeah, I think, you know, big way to, or easy way to put it is we're helping really connect the dots. You know, how do you connect all of these dots? You've got, yeah, you've got this great agency over here and, and how do they fit with, with my school? How do they fit with, gee, I need to, um, I need a lending. I need a device, you know, to try with this child. Where do I go get that? So we really try to help connect those dots. We also put out a, a monthly update. It's like a newsletter that goes out. It's emailed out to our members. Again, there's no charge for any of this. You, you get it. And the nice thing, about, one of the nice things about the update is uh, it. there's a lot of information in there and you take what you need, you know, and, and you can go back then and get more resources in a specific area. So, and I think, again, it's that support. You know, assistive technology is kind of like a little niche kind of an area, um, but it's people forget that it's it can be everywhere. And like mm -hmm. universal design, we're all using it. We just may not always call it the same thing. All right. So here we are towards the end of our interview. And uh, I'm going to guess some participants are listening to this and going, I'm excited. Like if they're doing it, maybe we can do it. We can do it in our state. Maybe there's state level people that would want to take it on. Um, or maybe they're already doing something similar and want to tweak it based on on what you what they heard here today. Or maybe it's an individual school district that's like, well, yeah, hey, heck, we could build something like this. Maybe we spend our year building this and launch it at the beginning of next school year. So with your experience having done this, what advice might you give somebody to either do or not do? <laughs> like stay away from, we, we went down this path and then said, oh, that's not a good use of our time. Let's do this. Or we were really awesome that we decided to do this. That turned out to be a really boon for us. What kind of advice might you give uh, someone who wants to get started in this or take whatever they have to the next level? I think the key to the success of this is really our team approach, our collaborative approach. We really have, you know, we have that core AT work, work group that through DPI and some of those uh, that, you know, people we just discussed, but then also recognizing, okay, we needed to, for example, build the micro-credentialing site program. And we recognize, okay, we need to pull in our IT, you know, so we really just, it was a amazing team approach and recognizing all of our strengths and what we could you know, bring to the project where we needed to ask for help. I think that was probably, that would be my first piece of advice. And then I'll turn it over to well, Daniel or Kathy. One of the things that made me think, you know, when we built the micro-credentialing program, I'm, I'm a very uh, careful steward of federal funding and state funding. And one of my asks was, I don't want you to build a $30,000 website that does this not going to happen. I want it to be free. Just use existing tools. So that's why they're using some of the Google platforms um, for how all of it works. And uh, we got uh, permissions from the the the, the tech AT modules folks. And Kathy has been a part of that group. And we made connections, um, as Stacy said, with, with Department of Health Service and other organizations and other agencies. And we're, we're, you can't have enough voices, you know, I think you, you really have to bring in, um, you know, we need more self-advocate voices, we need more higher ed voices, we need more family voices, um, you know, there's still things that we are wanting to expand, we absolutely need more general education voices and principals, um, so it's always just kind of keeping that open collaboration, um, but yeah, so those would be my that my voices are around that because a true community of practice really is looking at the whole person. 
Yeah, and I agree with all that. I mean, I, I love the fact that that we our meetings are very open. You know, we always tell people if you have a question, and we've always got somebody monitoring the chat, or we tell them to you know unmute yourself. You know, and we just tell them up front if you're going to uh, if you have a very specific question. You know, we always want to honor confidentiality and make sure that we're not going to cross any of those lines. But we do want to be able to get those questions answered. Um, another big thing I think is keeping the time allotment down. Like yes. our meetings are they're only about an hour long. And yeah, you can you can deal with that. And then when we rechunk them, we only chunk them into like 15, 20 minute sections because time, you know, there has to be that balance in life between work and, and home and everything else. And you want to have that. So we've we've tried to do that. Uh, our meetings are from four to five. We found that that's the niche time that we can get most people. Once you started after five, five fifteen, five thirty, and everybody just drops themselves right off. So you know, learning learning when you have the time to learn it, and I think that was the the key for those micro credentialing. And you know, if you if you're a night owl at ten o'clock at night and you want to go through ten pages and read ten pages, great. You know, but you can save an exit any time and go back to it. So that flexibility, great. I also want to add in something we did not mention with the micro credentials is we do a celebrations of people when they complete their micro credentials. Kathy mentioned the monthly update that. Uh, newsletter type publication that goes out and we recognize people who have been completing their micro credential badges just as a as a happy celebration hey awesome we are so glad that you participated so that's just another key because we all like celebrations that you know and we are so happy that uh, participants are learning and, and taking advantage of this amazing opportunity so i just wanted to point that out too uh is take time to celebrate uh we certainly we certainly do as we look at our data coming in and reflect on that wow look what we've done and, and look what our participants have done so stacy does that <laughs> celebration go out to like the 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 whole cop the community of practice yes it goes out to everyone in the community of practice so, so yeah i it's, i I just watched a TED talk on this. I wish I could remember what it was or find it, but about how um, that is a great marketing strategy in that to get other people to want to to get your product. Well, here it is, right? We want other people to show the celebrations of other people who have um, who have completed that. So that regular like shout out of people who have done it, it's like, I want to be like them. Oh, that, uh, John just completed this. Uh, Michaela just completed this. Oh, I want to com- I want to be like them. And so it gets a, a certain energy. So I think there's um I think that's really powerful. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And I also think it's a lot of value coming from when somebody in the field, in their field, who has taken time to do it and say, hey, yeah, you can do it. Because sometimes it feels a little different when we're coming in from, for example, in my position, more in a consultant position saying, here's this opportunity. Yeah, in theory, but it feels like I've got a lot on my plate. I don't know if I can do this. And then when you see other people can do it, you know, hey, I can do this too. I can find in time. And that's the beauty of it. It's self-paced. You can find it, you know, whenever you have that free little extra time. Hey, I'm going to start working on this. So absolutely. I I agree that uh, with your point, those celebrations are amazing. All right. Last question. And that is what comes next? I mentioned a little bit about this new partnership with um, the Wasteman Center through yeah, UW uh, Madison, and and they do amazing work around AAC assessment. And they already had a program working with educators, and they were very interested in this partnership with CISA two through this funding to um, help build capacity of educators through more of an ongoing, like more direct focused kind of virtual coaching model. So I'm really interested to see how that looks. Um, and uh, super excited about that piece of it moving forward. And also, you know, I think we we also need to look at, you know, what are those what I need to new, need to know now? We talked about the 15-minute chunks, but can we have three to five-minute little chunks of learning, uh, you know, really high leverage pieces? I'm a big believer in the special education high leverage practices. And like, what are the, the easy things that educators probably heard about or learned once, but just we don't do because it's not a habit? And how do we create simple, fast habits to promote access through existing? of technology. Awesome. That's so awesome. I, I, Daniel, everything you just said, that's the soundbite that we need to play everywhere, right? That's the little chunk because that's where, I mean, certainly we've seen that short videos uh, have impact. And then you had mentioned earlier, like we don't have the capacity really anywhere. Uh, I don't know that anyone's doing it super well for that coaching to get really better at that skill. So this yeah. is like the fundamental start of that, right? I so, would love to see if we could support a, a, a real 
really strong implementation coaching model, but that is, you know, that is obviously takes a, a totally different, it's way different than a community of practice, but that would certainly be an ideal too. Kathy, what do you think is our next steps? Well, I think the biggest thing that we started is we're starting a conversation. You know, we're starting that conversation around assistive technology and getting people to think more deeply about it versus just that little checkbox on the IEP. What really is it? So, you know, getting that that more ingrained in people and and letting people realize that it it's it's universal, it's everywhere. And I think people are getting better with knowing that our technology is there and it's not cheating that it's that this is what we need to do to move our students forward. Um, I think that that's kind of our next, next where to go. It's, it's not making it in this little silo kind of a thing. It's let's start a conversation. Let's think about how assistive technology can help all of our students and let's move them all forward. Let's, let's just keep moving forward. Love it. And Stacy. Yeah, I would echo that. You know, I, I think, as we, I think we'll have a probably a more clear answer as we get into the spring and see how our new expanded learning opportunities for gen ed teachers for our administration, how those are, you know, coming and and we'll learn from the feedback that we get talking about that sort of reflective phase and our action step, what's coming next. But I agree wholeheartedly. And we know um, from I guess I just also want to take a moment because we have the state leadership. Uh, Daniel has been fantastic. DPI has been wonderful in their initiative. And it, it really starts there. And we are so, Kathy and I, and I know I can speak on Kathy's behalf on this. We're so fortunate uh, to be a part of this amazing project. And we know it's because of the, our Department of Public Instruction in Wisconsin has recognized the value in this and has made it a priority. And again, it really starts with the leadership. And we do appreciate that, Daniel, and the team at DPI. Appreciate you. Going to make well, me cry. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, what, all tr- it's all true. So. Look what can happen when you have good support. Uh, amazing, amazing work. This is exciting. And I hope uh, as other people listen to this, they are just as excited as I am. I mean, we're recording this on a Friday afternoon and I'm wishing it was a Monday so I could be like, run to my supervisors and be like, can we do this? Let's do this. Um, it's it's really exciting. So thank you all for the work you're doing. And uh, I can't wait. I guess one last thing. Can people reach out to you? How do people learn about yeah. you and ask questions? Well, you can uh, search Wisconsin DPI Daniel Parker and you'll find my contact information there. And also we have uh, a website dedicated to the AT Forward Project and our contact information's on there. And then you also find information about the micro-credentials, the v- video resource library, our contact information, how to become a COP member, all that is on the AT Forward uh, webpage. Yeah, just search Wisconsin DPI Assistive Technology Forward and you'll get all kinds of good information. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking your time today and for for all this work and for sharing it with us today on the podcast. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris.